Hi everyone, this video is part three of the 3B series on learning for AP Psychology students. This particular video comes from unit three, which focuses on development and learning. And this lesson will focus on the consequences that shape our behavior, specifically regarding operant conditioning. As you can see on our unit outline, we are in the section titled 3B. So we're in the second section of this unit, and this particular focus is on the realm of learning. In our video today, we're going to go over the topic titled 3.8, which is operant conditioning. In this particular video, we'll focus on the consequences of operant conditioning that shape our behavior. These are the key focus questions for today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer all of them. Here are the vocabulary concepts that I will explain throughout the video today. By the end of the video, you should be able to define and describe them. As you already know, depending on a psychologist's perspective, they will likely approach studying learning in different ways. In the last video, you learned about a psychologist named John B. Watson, and although he was building on the work of Ivan Pavlov, it's John B. Watson that is considered to be the father of the behavioral approach to psychology. And this is because Ivan Pavlov uh, was a physiologist. He was studying the digestive process and he stumbled upon this psychological phenomena. So psychologists like John B. Watson, who is a behavioral psychologist and those that followed him focused on the objective side of psychology, one where you can observe and document measurable behaviors as indicators of learning. So with that said, we have one major topic to discuss that has to do with the behavioral approach to psychology, and that is called operant conditioning. In the previous two videos, you learned that people could be classically conditioned to produce involuntary reflexes when a an unconditioned stimulus is paired with a conditioned stimulus, but that might have been a little bit abstract. Today's video will focus on something really tangible, something that you're likely much more familiar with, and that's operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is when you produce a voluntary behavior because of a consequence. Both classical and operant conditioning are considered types of associative learning because in both cases, the subject is learning to produce a behavior because two things are paired together. In the case of operant conditioning, the pairing is between the voluntary behavior and the consequence. Today's video lesson will focus really specifically on the different types of consequences and how those consequences influence our behaviors. A man named B.F. Skinner is one of the most influential figures in behavioral psychology. His development of operant conditioning has helped us understand how we develop voluntary behaviors and how they are shaped. I'll spend the next two videos breaking down the most important pieces of operant conditioning and how it applies to the real world. But first, it's important to trace the beginning of this research, which began with a man named Edward Thorndike. Edward Thorndike was a psychologist in the early 1900s who studied animals and how they learned. He's best known for something called the law of effect, which says that behaviors that are followed by rewards are more likely to happen again, and behaviors that are followed by negative outcomes are less likely to be repeated. Edward Thorndike showed this with his puzzle box experiments, where cats learned how to escape the puzzle box by trying different actions and repeating the ones that worked. This idea was an important starting point for B.F. Skinner, who developed operant conditioning, creating a detailed framework for how behaviors are learned through reinforcement and punishment. While the law of effect explains the general concept of learning through consequences, operant conditioning provides very specific terms like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, and schedules of reinforcement. He also used controlled experiments to study how these consequences shape our behavior. So the law of effect was the foundation and operant conditioning is a more detailed way to understand how voluntary behaviors are shaped by consequences. Now the term operant comes from the verb operate. And B.F. Skinner used this word to describe the conditioning that happens when the behavior operates on the environment, one that either reinforces or punishes them. And B.F. Skinner was demonstrating how voluntary behaviors could be influenced by their outcomes. To explore this, he created what he called the operant chamber, which you can see depicted on the screen. Many people today refer to it simply as Skinner's box. And it's a controlled experiment where an animal like a pigeon or a rat 
could be conditioned to produce a specific type of behavior after receiving different types of consequences. One consequence he could issue to the animal is called a reinforcement. A reinforcement is a type of consequence that increases the likelihood of the behavior happening again. In this chamber, the animal would be reinforced with a food pellet. Another consequence he could issue was called a punishment. And punishments are types of consequence consequences that decrease the likelihood a behavior will continue. In his chamber, the animal would be punished with a shock. Now, by studying how these consequences either strengthened or weakened the animal's behavior, B.F. Skinner was able to analyze how these consequences could shape how the animal acted. And this really helped him understand these types of consequences and their effectiveness in training different types of voluntary behaviors. Now, B.F. Skinner identified two types of reinforcements, and he called them primary and secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are anything that naturally satisfies a biological need, like food or water. These are things that animals or humans don't need to learn to find rewarding because they fulfill a biological need. B.F. Skinner used primary reinforcers after the rat pressed a lever. They were given food. Secondary re reinforcers are rewards that we need to learn have value. These can be things like money or tokens or praise. They don't inherently have any kind of biological value, but they become rewarding through experience when we learn their value. In Skinner's experiments, he often used sounds like clicks as secondary reinforcers, which the animal learned to associate with rewards like foods. A click might seem a little unrelatable in this example to you, but you are reinforced by secondary reinforcers all of the time. Things that don't necessarily inherently have biological value, but we've assigned them value, like hearing applause after performing in a show or getting the letter A on a test after you have performed well. These are examples of secondary reinforcers. In both operant and classical conditioning, we use the terms stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization. And these are terms that are used to describe how animals respond to different stimuli. In operant conditioning, stimulus discrimination refers to the process where an animal learns to respond to different specific stimuli and not to others. So this means that the animal learns to distinguish between different stimuli and respond only to the one that signals a reinforcement. So in Skinner's operant chamber, what he would do is he would teach pigeons to peck when they saw a green light. And when the green light was on, they would peck. And so they would learn that this stimulus signaled it was time to do the behavior, but they would be able to discriminate between the colors green and red, because when the red light was on, they would not do the pecking behavior. So the pigeon learned to discriminate between the two lights pecking when they saw the green light because that was the behavior that was reinforced when the green light was on and they knew they would get a reward. On the other hand, stimulus generalization happens when an animal has been trained with one stimulus and they begin to produce that particular behavior with a similar stimuli. So if a pigeon is trained to peck at a key when they see a green light, they might also start pecking when they see a light of similar color, if a blue light Light turns on, even though they weren't specifically trained with that blue light. Uh, this is an example between the difference of stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization. So how do we get the individual from not doing the behavior to doing the behavior? And one process that's used is called shaping. And you can see shaping taking place in the brief recording on the screen. This is one of Skinner's pigeons being conditioned to turn around. When the pigeon starts to turn, even just a little bit, a light will turn on, signaling that he can get a treat. Then as the pigeon starts to do the behavior again and turn just a little bit more, the light will turn on again and the pigeon pigeon will get another treat. And this will happen over and over until the pigeon does the full behavior of turning all the way around. This process of gradually rewarding in successive approximations of the desired behavior, or more simply, a reinforcement is just given with each small step as they're getting closer and closer to the desired behavior, is called shaping. So an important consideration is that shaping cannot train 
all behaviors successfully. And this is shown through something called instinctive drift. Research on instinctive drift refers to the tendency for an animal's innate instinctual behaviors to interfere or override with a learned behavior. So only certain behaviors can be shaped through reinforcement because animals have natural instincts that may interfere with this shaping process or with a learned behavior. Research has shown that animals can learn a new behavior through reinforcement, um, but they can be really limited if it goes against their instinctual tendencies. So an example would be if a raccoon was trained to draw drop a coin into a container, it might start to engage in natural instinctive processes and drift away from the behavior it was being shaped to do. Um, it might be really fascinated with that shine and start rubbing and washing that coin um, because of its instinctual tendencies rather than taking it and then dropping it off into the container. And this drift back to its natural behavior occurs because some instinctive behaviors are so strong they can't be overridden through shaping and it can make it difficult to train certain types of behaviors. Up to this point, I've mostly just talked about one specific method of consequence, and that is the issuing of reinforcements. But consequences are more complex than just giving rewards. B.F. Skinner identified four different processes of consequences, and they are positive and negative reinforcements and positive and negative punishments. Now, the first thing that I need you to keep in mind is that positive does not mean good and negative does not mean bad. In this context, positive and negative mean to add and to subtract. Since you already know reinforcements encourage a behavior, let's put this together. A positive reinforcement is something that is added or given that encourages the subject to continue a behavior. So this might be something like a parent giving a child a cookie for helping put away his toys. By issuing this reinforcement, the child will likely continue the behavior. A negative reinforcement refers to when something is taken away and this encourages the subject to continue the behavior. Negative reinforcements are often confusing for students because they hear the word negative and they think bad. So sometimes students mistakenly think that a negative reinforcement is punishing, and that is not the case at all. Negative reinforcements encourage you to do the behavior again because something was taken from you. So if a mother tells her son that he won't have to sweep the floors if he completes his homework, every night before dinner. Removing this chore will encourage him to do his homework. So the goal of positive and negative reinforcements is so that the subject continues a behavior or continues to repeat this behavior again. The goal of a punishment is to stop a behavior. So positive punishments should discourage a behavior when something is added or when something is given. An example of this would be if you want to stop a dog from urinating in the house, you could add an unwanted stimulus of squirting him with water when he does. The squirt was added and it was added to discourage the unwanted behavior. Lastly, a negative punishment, like a positive punishment, discourages a behavior, but it does so by removing a desired stimulus. So if a teenager comes home late, hours after their curfew, a parent might use a negative punishment by taking away their keys for the weekend. Removing a desired stimulus to discourage a behavior like this is called a negative punishment. My biggest tip for students is when you are approaching a question that asks you to identify what type of consequence is being used, I suggest asking yourself these two questions. First, ask yourself in this scenario, will the behavior continue? If the answer is yes, then it's a reinforcement. If the answer is no, it's a punishment. Then ask yourself, why? Is it because something was given? If so, it's positive. If it's because something was taken, then it's negative. So now let's finish today's video with a few questions for review. Remember to pause the video after I read the question so you can determine the answer. Question number one says, Colleen uses reinforcement with her kids to cause a behavior too. 
Question number two says, which of the following scenarios best demonstrates negative reinforcement? Question number three says, dad is frustrated because three-year-old Maya has started to throw her toys often. He takes away one of her toys every time she throws one and eventually Maya stops throwing her toys. This is an example of so this concludes today's video lesson on the consequences that shape behavior through operant conditioning. You can check the answers to the multiple choice review questions at the bottom of the screen on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you can go through and check your understanding with the key focus questions and the list of vocabulary concepts.